Hello, you're listening to Two Old Chuffs, A Tale of Two Hospices. I'm Tamsin Thomas, and this is Cornwall Hospice Care's podcast. And very sneakily, I'm going it alone today, but for a special reason. This is a mini podcast, if you like, which we're recording as part of Grief Awareness Week. Now, this is a moment to reflect on some of the services that we at Cornwall Hospice Care have introduced, more especially during lockdown and since the arrival of this dreadful pandemic. And so I've gathered together our community services team to have a chat with them about the things that are on offer. And oh well, hello to you all. Um, hello. hello. We're on teams. Now, I need to explain to you, that means we're all sitting in completely different places around Cornwall and recording this. So hopefully we're not going to talk over each other. But who knows? Um, That's the joy of of digital working in in this new age. And I've got with me Claire Bray, Lolly Brewer and Tracy Davey, who all work on various projects that are to do with our engagement into and with our community. So it's really good to see you all. Um, One of the things I wanted to concentrate on, first of all, was a service which has really grown as we've gone through a lockdown. And that's the listening ear service. And I just wondered if one of you would like to explain what that's all about. Yeah, our listening ear service is, well, it's gone through a few different guises since we started at the beginning of lockdown. But essentially, we're there for anybody that feels like they need a bit of support having gone through a bereavement. Uh, So we offer telephone calls. We can have six up to an hour plus a little short follow up at the end. And we're there just to be a listening ear, really, so that people can chat through uh, how they're feeling. And we're there to offer that listening ear to be with somebody while they're going through that. But also perhaps we can signpost them to other uh, organisations that might offer some support or websites and things that are going on now that things are beginning to start up again. So that's essentially what it's all about. And who is calling the listening ear? Do you know who these folk are? No, we get referrals coming in largely from social prescribers, GPs uh, and a few different other organisations as well. And it's been great. We've had I mean, it's a real mixture of people that come to us. Um, Sometimes their bereavement is very, very new. Uh, Sometimes it can be a little bit older. Um, And it's it's a real mixture across the board of, of people in our community. I don't quite know how to, to, to phrase this question, but how how desperate are they when they come to you or, or do we manage to make contact with them before the grief has got too overwhelming? It Again, it's a real mixture. Um, sometimes the people that are referred to us are really in, in a not very great place. Um, and it's great when we get the referrals. Often there's other people involved with looking after them as well. You know, it could be they might be having um, experiencing some troubles with their mental health as well. So the GPs and the social prescribers and other teams are also involved in looking after them so that we can really focus on the emotions and the troubles they're having with the bereavement. Um, But, yeah, some people and I think, you know, like everything, the pandemic has affected how people are coping with their emotions and their feelings. And yes, it's been it's been an interesting journey, but hopefully just being there on the end of the phone and a voice for people to talk to. It's people find it very supportive. I'm a huge believer in that phrase. It's good to talk. And I'm always aware that those of us who have a friend or or a contact that is willing to talk are privileged. Uh, and I, I have a, a very dear friend and, and quite often we talk about things like bereavement. We've both experienced bereavement in the last two years, but I know how valuable that is. And it it must be heartbreaking when you haven't got that special person that you can talk to. So yeah. they, they, it must be so rewarding to be at the end of that phone. It really is. It's lovely. And for a lot of people, they just feel that they don't want to burden their families either with how they're feeling. So just having a complete stranger on the end of the phone to chat through and be able to talk about whatever they want to talk about is is really positive for people. So, yeah, it's massively rewarding. It's lovely. And we've had some lovely conversations with people. And do we just give them the one call or is there a follow up system? 
Yeah, no, we, we speak to them. I mean, in total, it's actually eight conversations that we have because we do a bit of an assessment call and then they can have up to six calls, which, you know, so it can last up to an hour. And then at the end of the six calls, we leave a nice little gap, sort of six week gap. And then we give them a call again just to check in with them and see how they are just as a follow up call. So the obvious question is, what's the number? How do people get in touch? Do you know, now I'm going to stumble. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> all right. We'll cover for you. We'll cover for you go by on. saying you can go so, to the website at cornwallhospitalcare.co.uk to I find out. <laughs> 829-874. And once again? 01726-829-874. Or they can, like you say, go through the, the via the website. And is that uh, available during a certain period of time each day? It's Monday to Friday, um, sort of nine till four. That, 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 that's, that's manned. But there is an answer phone um, on and, and really, I'm the only one that will, up, will pick that up. So people don't need to be worried about leaving a message. And, you know, it's all confidential. Um, so, yeah, but, but normal working up hours, really. And we can get back to people quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. A week or a couple of days, usually. Yeah. And it's proved enormously successful, hasn't it? Because when did it launch? Maybe March time last year. Um, you've you've had a lot of calls, haven't you? We have. Yeah, we've had loads of calls. We've had, is it 100, Tracy? Oh, it's over 200, isn't it? Over 200, yeah. So with, with it's, like you say, with, with the pandemic and every kind of lockdown, we have a peak. And, you know, then it's over the summer, it's settled, the, the referrals settled a little bit. But then as the winter's setting in, the, the numbers have gone back up again. So it's definitely that isolation is, is really affecting people. And for you guys who, who are running and managing that phone line, grief is a very, I think, tricky. Is that the word I'm looking for? Because we all experience grief in a different way. It affects everybody so differently. I, have you had training for this? Uh, or is it life experience that helps you? How do you deal with it? I think it's a mixture, isn't it, for all three of us? Yeah, because we've all got different experiences that we bring. Um, but yes, I mean, now we're in the lovely position where it's got so big, we've had to recruit some volunteers to help with the calls as well. So we give training to our volunteers, um, but a lot of them equally have amazing life experience that, that lead them to being fantastic listening ears. Yeah, so it's a bit of a, a, a mixture of things, really, training and personal experience and, yeah, the whole lot. It's ongoing training, really, because yeah. there's quite a lot of information out there and, and and now lots of lots of sessions and training sessions that we're constantly part of, um, you know, like the Good Grief Festival or Lifting the Lid Festival, you know, so there's so, so many resources out there that kind of constantly add to our we like to call it an arsenal of skills. Um, and, and every time we gather that information, uh, new information and resources, we can then add that to our ever growing useful links directory, which can be found on our site. And bereavement and grief is just part of that um, uh, bank of information and resources that we offer offer clients. And I, and I think it's worth mentioning, if I might, um, you know, just to touch on what Claire said, we are there not as counsellors, just to, to be clear about that. We're not counsellors, but as, as we've said, we have a vast personal and professional bank of experience. But what we what we often say to people is that we're here to sit beside you in this time. We're not going to we're not there to judge you or 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 try and, you know, suggest that you should be doing things differently but if you ask us for support and information what what we aim to do is is to provide that um and and allow you the chance and the opportunity to explore pathways um strategies and then we tend to to space the the points out so that they've got time to perhaps go away and explore those and then come back to us in maybe a couple of weeks or anywhere between a couple of weeks and a, and a month to tell us how that how that's worked for them. You know, how did you get on with writing a journal? How did you, you know, have you been for walk in 
outside during the day? Have you managed to, for some people, just get out of bed and eat something? Mm. And I think, so what, you know, we're, we're big on analogies. So we talk about, you know, being in a dark well, grief is a lot for people. And, you know, whilst people at the top of this metaphorical well can throw down lots of ropes for them to climb, um, what they often need is for somebody to just sit beside them and shine a little, a little torch on a foothold for them to try out themselves. So that's kind of what we aim to do is, is, is to, to allow them the opportunity to explore their own way forward to the next part of their story. Do you ever worry that you might ask or say the wrong thing? I think you, you soon know if you have. Um, but you can you get a you get a good sense of the person you're talking to, I think, quite early on. And it's yeah. And it's exploring things with them. Like Lolly said, you know, you're sitting with them, you're walking with them. So you just explore things as you go along. And yeah, not being scared of silences as well and just letting yeah. things sit and sink in. And yeah, the key word is listening. Yeah. What we're there to do is listen. And, you know, people will often say, you know, I'm frightened of talking to somebody who's bereaved because it'll make them cry. Now, make no bones about it. They're crying inside often, even if their face is smiling. We're not making them cry. What we're giving them the opportunity to do is to let some of that go in a safe space if they feel that they can. Um, and I think it's a lot of myth busting, really. You know, this. The concept that you move on from grief, you don't move on. It stays the same. What we do is we we learn to grow new shoots around yeah. what we have left of our former self, former life. And normalising yeah. those feelings for people as well, yeah. isn't it, often? Sure. People feel like they're going mad or they shouldn't be feeling this way or other people have told them that they shouldn't be feeling this way still. And it's just normalising all that, all those feelings of grief. Yeah. And, and that goes back to what I said about um, grief is so different for every person, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that you can't predict what grief is going to look like anyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're very, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to offer this service at this time for people. And then, you know, um, and we're also fortunate that we could, we have such a strong team of volunteers and, and and a strong team generally where we can where we can chat about you know how it is for us because you know it can it can be tough sometimes working within this this subject matter but um you know uh i think it does feel like we make absolutely we make a difference yeah um and we don't doubt that because Tracy does such a brilliant job at collecting the qualitative, you know, the comments from 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 yeah. clients. We've had some wonderful, wonderful comments, you know, too many to to, to say. But, you know, it, it, we definitely feel like we're making a slight if we make a slight difference, then that's great. And anything more, you know, is a bonus. We want to feel, let the, have that person at the end of the call just feel slightly better then at the beginning, then then that's great. You know, we're we're, yeah. we're happy that we've we've managed to to help them with that a little bit. And I think because often the <clears throat> excuse me, often the journey from them starting to talk with us to to their eighth appointment essentially is anything up to six months. We can really track that process that they're moving through, and you know. By virtue of, you know, asking them questions one to ten about how they're feeling physically, mentally, you know, emotionally and um, lots, you know, how they're coping with daily tasks, how they're managing to do the things that they have to do, like paying bills. You know, it's very clear to us that at the end of those sessions that there's often been quite a vast improvement. Now, we're not arrogant enough to think that that's just because they've spoken to us for sure. Mostly there are other services involved, but what's important to know that, you know, that somewhere along the line, um, something changes for people. Um, and that makes us feel like, yeah, this is a really, really valuable service that the hospice, Cornwall Hospice Care can offer. 
Yeah. And do you know, uh, we're all about myth busting, whoever yeah. we are in the hospice. Uh, and quite often I find when I say to people where I work, they say, oh, that, that must be so difficult, so hard. I love moments like this where mm. we can produce a podcast and we can listen to three of you yeah. showing how you must go home some days feeling Yes. Or stay you know, at home. That's sometimes. been a good day. Or stay at home as a lot yeah. of us are at the moment. But I, I can't begin to imagine what it must feel like when you've had one of those hour long calls and someone says to you, even if they only say thank you, that must put you in such yeah. a, a positive position. Yeah. Or even getting to the end of all the calls when you do, you know, call six or even the follow up. And you can really tell that they're, you know, they're kind of moving on or they've, they're doing things that they never thought they would do at the beginning or they're starting to go out or whatever it might be, the smallest of little things. It's really lovely to hear that progression and that change in people as you go through it. Yeah, it's really lovely. And we end up having some lovely conversations. Yeah, I was going to say, we made a conscious decision that those calls would last, uh, you know, four, five, six months because for those people with the bereavement, if we only spoke to them for, for six weeks, it's such a short amount of time. Yeah. You know, it's a very long journey for them. You know, so the, 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 the longer we can be with them and helping them along in any way, the better. Yeah, that's tremendous. It really is. It's so heartening. And and how wonderful that we have a service like this, uh, the listening ear service. So we'll repeat uh, all the information you need at the end so that you know how to get hold of it. You're listening to our podcast from Cornwall Hospice Care. It's Two Old Chuffs, A Tale of Two Hospices. But it is today only me, Tamsin Thomas, talking with our community services team, Claire Bray, Lolly Brewer and Tracy Davey, who are reaching out and talking to folk beyond the walls of the hospice, which is very exciting. And as we've just heard from the listening ear, very beneficial to people who are dealing particularly with grief, which is such a difficult subject. But there's more to this as well. And we are offering, aren't we, Tracy, support to carers. So tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely. So we, we offer um, pre-bereavement support for carers of um, for caring for anybody that has a palliative diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis at any stage um, leading up to that. So it can be a year away um, from being having the diagnosis, um, we're able to, to offer emotional or psychological support to that carer. Um, this is part of um, under our umbrella of the neighbourhood hub service that we offer. So we offer support for patients. Um, so we offer um, mobility advice, symptom control advice, activities of daily living, that sort of thing for the patients, but very much so that we're there for the, for the carer as well. I don't want to say, are they the forgotten part? But really, that is the question. Yeah, Do carers so. get overlooked? Absolutely, they, they can. And we, and we really try. And I know as, as part of the hospice, it's very much that we're there for the family um, and the carers as much as the patient. But, but it can be that they are overlooked and, and feel very overwhelmed um, w- w- with what they're having to deal with. Um, and yeah, it can be very difficult. And so uh, whatever help we can offer, the psychological help, very similar to the listening ear, um, the, the signposting, any strategies, any resources, um, or just having somebody to talk to and talk it through. Um, I think very much there's a lot potentially of guilt with, you know, people that are looking after the patient. You know, if, they, if they're not coping, they feel that they're not doing as much as they should be. So then if no one's looking after them, how can they look after their loved one? So it's kind of our role to help them. And then there's that horrible mix of things that all happened because of COVID. So we couldn't run our hubs and we, we still aren't <laughs> running them. Um, but equally, the people we needed to talk to were the people who were coming and then they couldn't come out because of the pandemic. Yeah. You know, how have you waded through that and still been able to help? Well, we're, we're offering telephone support and video support. Um, so, you know, just trying to to access those people as, as easily as possible um so yeah it is a shame that the hubs aren't 
open face to face because that is what a lot of people want that face to face contact but we we seem to you know still having you know a lot of referrals come through so it's it's not a barrier it doesn't appear to be a barrier which is great it's all about conversations isn't it all of this we're talking about yeah yeah, yeah. i think as well to some degree with 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 it being telephone contact you know the, the hubs as they existed pre-pandemic um you know for some people distance could be an issue so it, to some to some degree there's an advantage by mm. now offering other yeah we've widened our net really because for sure and it, and it i suspect it's something that will stick as an option oh i would have thought so. even yeah. you know when we do have more face-to-face options at least we've, we've now got several options that people mm. can choose so there are a lot of certainly from a community services point of view a lot of pluses with the way that we've changed our working um, we're not charging so, around the countryside are we from from venue to venue you know i th- i think technology has been an extremely valuable part of the whole pandemic um yeah. for lots and lots of reasons and i know it's not always the answer and sometimes face to face is so much better mm-hmm. but we all leap on and off this technology now um and and in doing it you're making a difference to people aren't you which yeah. is extraordinary and equally Interestingly, um, the other day I was out walking with the person um, which she and I are supporting each other as we cope with our grief. And we noticed several other people sitting on benches talking. Yeah. And we and we said that might just be a real positive at the end of this horrible pandemic. Yeah. We're maybe talking a bit more and maybe to each other and maybe to people we didn't talk to before. Yeah. And I also think that that for some people, they would struggle with face to face opening up. And we've certainly found that there is there is definitely a place for not not having eye contact, um, allowing someone to express themselves. It doesn't work for everybody. Some people need that face to face. But absolutely walking alongside somebody, which is which which we do both metaphorically and and quite clearly in real real terms, um, allowing them to feel that they can express themselves without the perhaps the intensity of face to face work. Um, So perhaps that's where we have found that people that perhaps might not open up so readily have had the opportunity to try new ways. A little bit more anonymous over the phone, isn't it? Like you say, you're not under the pressure of of that, that gaze of somebody. And maybe you can say something to someone on the phone that you couldn't say either to someone face to face or perhaps to a closer member of your family or, or your friendship circle. You're yes, that not, bit more anonymous. Yeah. 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 I'm always amazed at how people do open up to us on the phone, actually. And once you get that rapport going, you know, by the time you're into call two or three, people really do open up. And maybe that is not being face to face. And yeah, maybe this whole thing has just taught us a lot more about communication that we'd lost sight of before. Hopefully, and hopefully that stays. Yeah. And sometimes people tell us things. They say, "I haven't, I've never told anybody this." Yeah. Yeah. And it, but it, you know, often it's attached to more broader grief mm. rather than the, the 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 reason that they made that initial contact with us. So that's and always quite um, humbling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels an honour, doesn't it, that yeah, people sure. all are happy to open up and they trust us, and it makes yes. us a safe space. Yeah, it's a privilege. Yeah. For sure. It is. Yeah. And I think that leads nicely on to the the third strand of work that you've developed during the pandemic. And this is harnessing uh, a social media channel, uh, in this case, Facebook, to host a virtual friendship cafe. Uh, And again, you know, uh, it's surprising how many people have found and discovered the value of social media during this period. I know there's downsides, but this is a very positive side. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that concept. Uh, Well, that, again, was born out of, okay, we're in lockdown. What do we do next? Because we were building these community friendship cafes throughout Cornwall. And and like um, Claire and Tracy said, you know, we were driving to venues and setting everything up and hoping people would come. But it was very much in its infancy, although we had planned to open up to 10 that 
uh, that year, last year. Um, and then suddenly the brakes were on and we said, OK, we need to respond. Well, how can we respond? So within probably a week or two, um, we designed a similar concept on on social media. So the way it worked in real time is that what we were offering was very much um, our knowledge base of resources where anybody who was socially isolated, carers or anyone living with long term illness, so anybody that was recently bereaved, or in fact, anybody that would have a conversation about the hospice with us could come, have a cup of tea, have a chat and, you know, um, do an activity perhaps um, and ask us about anything that was going on for them. Um, and that could be bereavement, but quite often it was it was uh, mental health. It might have been um, finance. It might have been um I don't know, just general health. Uh, and we were planning on working with social prescribers jointly to, to host these spaces. And so, as I say, in March, we were uh, crikey, what do we do? So instantly, pretty like I said, in, within two weeks, it was on social media, Facebook as the virtual community friendship cafe. <laughs> um, and what we hope to do on that in that space, and, and I think what we what we do do and what we offer is daily um, posts of anything that we think people that are struggling might find useful. Quite a lot of it is to do with mental health and bereavement, but sometimes it can be, you know, affirmations, um, crikey, all, all kinds of concepts about carers. It might be something about, um, I don't know, Claire. I mean, there's a million things, isn't there? Yeah, so, finance. Mindfulness, yeah. all, all sorts of things, yeah. Joyful activities that people might just try out. For instance, I posted something about a yoga beginners class. So it's, you know, you're, you'll be the same as everyone else turning up. If you ever wanted to try it, try gentle yoga. There might be, um, uh, you know, any, any kind of, any number of, uh, affirmations that might, might, strike a note with somebody reading it and go yeah that's exactly how I'm feeling actually I thank you for putting it into words um people do join uh, via our sort of private page um so is that uh, how they find you they go yeah, to Facebook so I, I and put private, in virtual... it's, it's not private it's a public page but they have to ask to join and answer a couple of questions about why they might be want, wanting to join and once once they're in you know obviously they can share all kinds of stuff um, that they've found useful. And all they need to do is go on to Facebook and search the Virtual Community Friendship Cafe page. You can't miss it. It's bright yellow with a with a heart on it. Um, and, yeah, just request to join. And, and, yeah, I think we probably post anywhere between two to five things during the day. Um, and you can also find it via our community services um, web link, which is on the main Cornwall Hospice Care website. Um, Super, and we'll put it on the home page of the website so it'll be easy for people to find. It, I've, I've, a lot of the conversation um, recently has been about mental health, and you've just yeah. referred to that. Yeah. Would you like to see the conversation around grief and bereavement become as big and as much a part of our general conversations yeah and i think i think it's changing for sure because i think uh, and we're certainly part of, of a variety of sort of professional networks where they're working very very sort of doggedly towards how we carry on having these conversations now we're coming to to get used to the pandemic and what that might mean um for people and and I and I think that you know it's it's a it's a bigger it's as big a problem really as coming to terms with normalising if you like mental health you know this phrase it's okay not to be okay and I think what we've what we recognise as professionals is that they do dovetail because one affects the other um, and you can't separate them it's Often people will, you know, say, oh, well, surely you're just talking to people that are bereaved. Well, 
actually no, they come with a multitude of other you know subjects that they want to talk about because if it was somebody that was kind of swimming along nicely and was bereaved and they kind of can can move through that without any need to seek additional support then they wouldn't aren't necessarily the people we talk to the people we are talking to are the people that are really kind of side blinded by by their grief and you know they do come with other other issues perhaps you know they they may have had periods of anxiety and low mood throughout life and this has just made a difficult journey much more unbearable and so I, I, I see, I see, um, I see Claire and Tracy nodding like mad there. One of the things that I often hear people say, and you'll have heard the phrase, it, um, the, the only thing in life that's assured is, is it death, birth and taxes or something. But yeah. I think it should be all of those and grief and bereavement. I don't know what you think, Claire. But yeah. It's going to happen to us all. Yeah. Definitely. And it's that I still think there's a lot in this country of that kind of British stiff upper lip sort of attitude that we just have to all oh, dust yourself down and get on with it. And often a lot of people we speak to have done exactly that. And then all of a sudden, a little bit further down the road, it hits them like a steamroller. And then it just everything sort of falls apart, really. And it's it's that whole thing of encouraging people to talk about things more yeah. and to not feel scared of talking about death and dying and bereavement and mental health and yeah I still think there's a long way to go but it's it is beginning and I think that's probably a generational thing isn't it oh definitely yeah, yeah. and like you said earlier Tamsin are, are we worried about saying the wrong thing and I think that is that is a massive problem you know people will cross the road to avoid somebody because they don't want to even engage in a conversation because oh I might say something that's going to upset them but like you said Lloyd, they're already in the, the, yeah. the darkest moment anyway yeah. so you're, you're not going to make it any worse but by acknowledging them and not crossing the road to avoid them then you know we, yeah it's uh, we definitely need to to be much more vocal um yeah. and, and talk about death and dying and, and and bereavement and unfortunately for certainly our friends and family we do it every day. So we talk about it anywhere, everywhere. You know, I've been at dinner parties and then somebody mentions something and they say, oh, you know, what do you do for work? And then there's a silence. Now, I'm, I'm never sure if that's because they're, well, thanks. You put a real damper on the evening or because people, but I think genuinely, generally, it's because people are fascinated and do want to talk about it because it's not just a monologue from me. It is definitely an interjected but, you know, we have to be careful that we know where, when to stop. <laughs> you know, when the coffee comes out, perhaps you stop. <laughs> but, but also be prepared for the moments when the conversation does start. And yeah. sometimes that conversation can start when you least expect it. So sure. um, a, a friend and I were having coffee and a robin landed on the table. And right. she said, without even hesitating, is that your dad or my mum? Yeah. And so we laughed and we started talking about it. And the two ladies on the next table started to join in and say, yeah. actually, no, I think it might be my mum. And yeah. like that, we went from just catching up to a whole discussion about, you know, losing a parent. Yeah. And it was really good. We pushed the tables together. The four of us yeah. chatted. Oh, and lovely. you must be you. You three have got to be ready for that moment. We're never off time. duty, Tamsin. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, Friday afternoon you close the computer but then you might spend all week talking about bereavement death and dying and preparing planning that's often a big conversation and i and, and i think something that claire, claire said a minute ago about about you know um how how grief how grief comes to people and and quite often you're you because people do put a lid on it often particularly there is there is a small you know ever growing cohort of older people that are used to doing that because it's we know in in this time of our life it's okay not to be okay it's very much out there but i think you know for for that that older cohort because they're so adept at keeping it in you know sometimes and we'll often say this sometimes you know they'll come to us and the the, the bereavement might have been three years ago but they've i don't know I'm being flippant, but stubbed their toe 
And actually, they're not crying about the stub toe or the, or the cut on their hand. They're crying about something else or an animal. Quite often we've had several people come to us. They've lost a pet. And although it's thoroughly devastating, what they're often crying about are things that, you know, that five or six bereavements that have happened over 30 years. Now, that's just as valid for us as as any other grief. You know, it's the catalyst for us. I mean, we te- we tend to we have to set some kind of um, referral system because, you know, if people come to us and and they have a bereavement that was perhaps 20 years ago or even five years ago, quite often it's a psychosocial issue that has led them to contacting us. And so it might be more appropriate that they they have support elsewhere. Um, but generally speaking, we, we say within three years, um, because, yeah, things can keep a lid on them. They, people can keep a lid on grief for a bit. And then ultimately it's like a pressure cooker. It will go bang and it will rear its head. So I know you're busy people, but is there something in the future about um, helping others to learn how to start a conversation, spreading the word, if you like, about grief and bereavement? Yeah, definitely. I think so. And as we kind of in the future, as we move to perhaps doing a bit more face to face, I think that's part of our job, isn't it? To talk to people about starting those conversations and how to have those conversations and yeah that's definitely part of what we do and what we'd encourage absolutely and rather than saying they're difficult conversations let's call them important conversations and and try and avoid that difficult bit yeah already you've kind of broken down a little barrier then already so it's about being really careful about the language we choose mm. yeah. to open, open that doorway to say look you know i mean who knows one day we'll have spaces where we can we can have these conversations invite people to have these conversations with us um we're not there yet but we'd like to think that we'll be you know leading in that within within Cornwall it's good to have an ambition isn't it because look at the work you as a team have achieved more particularly since covid came along yeah. and i'm keeping a positive uh, angle on that yeah, yeah. you know you've achieved so much that uh, it, you can now look and say oh we've got ambitions based out of what we've achieved so far it's good to have a positive out of out of the pandemic definitely yeah. you know we've had to maybe bring things forward that we maybe would have wanted to do two years down the line but because we had to rethink everything we yeah. would have the time then to, to bring that forward and, and develop that earlier than we would have we would have done in normal times yeah. And I think I think one of the other things we're really proud of and we, we celebrate it all the time is that over the last four years that this part of community services has been growing, we have taken all of those resources and all of that knowledge base. And instead of kind of keeping it here to, close to us, we've been able to host that on the website. And I know I alluded it, to it earlier, but the useful links directory Any number of professionals now are keeping it open on their browser as a go to space for, um, you know, information and resources and pathways, both nationally and locally, that they can they can find support for their clients or indeed any member of the public can view it. And there's a whole host of subject matter on there. And yes, a big part of it is bereavement, but there's. There's, you know, crisis lines for for mental health and bereavement. There are finance, you know, pathways for carers. And so it's all on there. So, again, that can be found on Cornwall Hospice Care's main website. If you search community services, you'll find the link. If you scroll down, um, you'll see all these services and and resources that community services have, has to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's about the third page down. So super. And important to say that all our services are free. Yeah. And, you know, the people quite often say, oh, do we have to have had a connection with the hospice? Not at all. No. Not at all. You know, with the listening ear, we do get referrals from professionals, but the individuals can ring themselves. Absolutely. They, they can refer. Yeah. 
I think that's a really yes. important note to uh, end on there, that it's free. You don't have to have a link to the hospices. And you've all talked about the privilege of helping people. I need to tell you it's a privilege to talk to the three of you because the passion uh, and the commitment to what you do shines through. It really does. Um, so thank you. And thank you for your time, because I know just how busy you are. Um, I hope someone I hope those volunteers have been busy answering the phone lines <laughs> while we've been talking. But thank you. Uh, oh, you've been for inviting us. Um, not yeah. at all. Not at all. We can <laughs> we can talk about community services any day of the week, um, you know. And let's regroup in one year's time and do it again, shall we? Fine. <laughs> You've been listening to Two Old Chuffs, The Tale of Two Hospices, and we've been meeting the Cornwall Hospice Care Community Services team, Claire Bray, Lolly Brewer and Tracy Davey. And to find out more, go to the homepage of our website, cornwallhospicecare.co.uk.